2021 National Specialty Seminar presented, brought to you by the sponsorship of the GPCA Health Committee. We are very pleased today to have Dr. Gerald Bell here, and he will be talking about pedigree analysis, genetic disease, and disorders in Great Pyrenees, and his talks will be specific to Great Pyrenees. There are handouts at the ends of the two tables in the back that is background information on uh, genetic analysis that Dr. Bell has provided us. So please take one of those packets and please mute your cell phones, but do not turn them off because there will be some polling aspects as part of this presentation and you can respond with your cell phones. We are also collecting DNA for the Dwarf Project, and you can get DNA for NDG. And we have the ability to collect blood or cheek swabs, whatever your preference is. Blood is better, but anyway, I would like to introduce Dr. Gerald Bell, and please enjoy the seminar. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. And uh, just so that you know, the uh, um, the program for today it is a three-hour seminar. Uh, we will be taking a break, approximately halfway between a ten-minute break, um, and uh, it is jam-packed with all of your specific read information. So it will go very quickly, and uh, and it is being recorded because. You're not going to pick up everything the first time around uh, with all of what I'm presenting today, so we are having it recorded. I put a lot of work into the um, into researching your breed and getting very, very specific information for you. Um, the uh, I want to thank everyone whose um, pictures of their dogs I stole from your websites to populate the slides to make it interesting for you. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so the the talk is entitled "The Genetic Health of the Great Pyrenees." And, and I know that's a scary title because, oh my God, it's a genetics lecture and, and you know, I, I didn't do well in biology. But really, this is practical genetics uh, for great Pyrenees breeders and owners. So it's all very practical. There's very few large words that I'm going to be using today. And those few words that I am using, I'm going to define for you so we all understand what I'm talking about. Um, I am a, a member of the board of directors of the OFA a not-for-profit, the largest not-for-profit um, database uh, for health testing information in dogs around the world. And uh, I will go through some of the tools that we have on the LFA website for you today as well. But primarily, I am a small animal practitioner. Um, I am a solo practitioner. I own my own practice, and I have been uh, in my own practice since uh, 89, so it's been a while. Um, I was trained. Uh, at Cornell for my uh, veterinary degree. I was trained at, at Michigan State University and then the University of Missouri for my genetics uh, background and training. But pretty much what I see in my practice is pet dogs and cats. And so I see the product of what is being bred in America or randomly bred in America um, for people. I have a um, excellent reproductive bed about two miles from me. And so she sees all of the breeder clients. I actually have two breeder clients, but, um, but the uh, uh, majority of breeder clients go to the reproductive bed. And so I'm just seeing pet dogs and cats and understand what, what is out there. And I do see a fair amount of the great currencies, and they're very, very uh, nice dogs to work with. Um, I also, I claim to be a breeder, although my wife makes all the breeding decisions. Um, this is my boy Bobby, who's at home. This was the day that he uh, obtained his junior hunter title. Uh, as a sporting breed, we like to put um, a decent junior on all of our dogs to show that they have the abilities of what they were bred for. And that's something important to talk about. So we're gonna, all we're talking about today is breeding, is about breeding great purities. And if you're breeding a breed, um, it's important to see that you maintain the qualities that the breed developed over 60, 70, 80 generations. Because if you're not selecting for what was originally selected for, then 
what happens with your breed can drift away. And so it's important that they at least have some instinct of their natural purpose um, to be able to reproduce that. Um, so this was Bobby the day he came to his uh, here, and you can see all the sticks and twigs and things. It took about two hours to get rid of all those afterwards. This is his little sister, Maddie, um, when she won a, a dog, little dog show in New York. Um, and, uh, uh, so she took breed, and uh, that was, and she was homebred. And that was three years after her mother took breed at Westminster. So, um, so we really tried to select, you know, to, for the best confirmation as well as the working ability of our dogs. And we have several master hunters as well. Okay, so with the polling that we're doing today, is that in focus for you guys? Okay. So for polling today, I want you to take out your cell phones, and the best way to do the polling is if you can go to a web page and just put in com slash gpc and if you go to that then every single poll will just pop up on your screen you just have to tap your answer if you uh, can't get to a web page you want to text you are texting to the address 22333 and then for the first time only you would text gpca and hit and hit enter and then after that you would type in your answers a or b um, if you're going to the web page, you can accept cookies or you cannot accept cookies. You don't have to sign in. It's completely anonymous. So when I ask you about what diseases you see in your dogs, you can sign and tap all the, all the horrible things that you've seen. And, uh, and so it's not traced back to you in any way. So we've got uh, six people already. The question is, I love Great Pyrenees or I love Siamese cats? I just want to make sure that you guys are in the right room because if the cat people are in here, it's going to be a long morning. Okay, so 100% of you um, love great curries, so that, and if you're still working on getting you know, getting yourself oriented, and we've got some more slides coming up. So the next question I have for you, this is a free-form text answer. So you're just typing in an answer and hitting send. Um, what is the greatest genetic health issue of Great Pyrenees? And you can abbreviate or you can do whatever, whatever you want there, and it will immediately pop up on the screen, so please no profanity. And uh, let's see what you feel the greatest health issue is for your dogs. Okay, bone cancer, osteosarcoma, bone cancer. So that's that's a pretty straightforward uh, issue that we have here. Gingival hyperplasia is an issue. Old age, not able to get up in the rear. Cancer, um, tip dysplasia, bone cancer. Backyard breeding. Osteosarcoma. You know, we'll talk about the breeding, but you, know, you certainly have far less backyard breeding than some of the, you know, than boxers and some of the really populous breeds. So, so I think you feel you at least still have control of your breed, even though there are non-club members and, and quote, backyard breeders that are, are breeding peers. Okay. All right. Um, and trophy on. Good enough. So we'll be talking about, uh, about that, those, and many others. And lastly, what are your questions? What, what questions are, were you hoping that I was going to answer for you today? And uh, let's see um, what you're interested in hearing about. sarcoma a genetic disease a disorder yes it is inherited from the parents breeding better dogs we'll be talking a lot about that are all health issues genetic no you know you've got viruses you've got uh, 
um, nutritional issues, um, you've got injuries. Um, okay, will there ever be testing for multi-gene defects? Um, yes, there will, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Effective breeding genetically over a long period to develop a line, we'll talk about that. Um, what genetic issues become less and less frequent? We'll talk about that because your Gladstone's thromasthenia is really a very low frequency disease now. Breeding programs for tanning carriers and breeding programs, we'll deal with that. Um, designer dogs and the impediment to the breed, we can talk about that a little bit as well. Okay. All right, so we will be addressing uh, the majority of those issues um, in the talk today. Okay. So the first half of the talk is going to talk about your breed's gene pool and about breeding. And then the second half of the talk will talk about health and genetic disorders and breeding away from those genetic disorders. And I'm not presenting all of the information in the slides today because actually it would go a lot longer than three hours. But everything is in the handout that you need to know as well. So, so I'm just hitting the high points on the slides today and discussing some of the uh, issues that go along with it. A large number of individuals in a breed population provides greater choices when making breeding decisions. So it's important that you have and maintain a, a fairly large gene pool so that you have choices. You know, if there's only you know, four males available for breeding in your breed and there's some breeds that that's what they have, you have very little choice, you've got to choose one of those four. But the more dogs that you produce, the greater your choices are in terms of who you breed to, what you're breeding for, what you're selecting against in that regard. And so let's talk a little bit about selection because that's what breeding is all about. It's about selection. It's, it's, you know, I hope nobody here just says, oh wow, I've got a great Pyrenees, you've got a great Pyrenees, let's breed them together. You know, they could both be bitches, but you know, it's, you know, but that, you know, mentality, it's like, like there's no other decision process that goes on. Let's bring every other, you know, but that's not true. It's all about selection. What we need to understand is that with each selected trait or disorder that we're paying attention to, the proportion of the available gene pool decreases. And so we need to understand, so if this circle here represents the entire gene pool of the Great Pyrenees breed, and then we apply one genetic test, or we're selecting for or against one specific trait, you know, top line, reach, you know, gear set, you know, just whatever you're selecting for or selecting against, um, you're only going to be utilizing an area of the gene pool where those dogs fulfill that selection uh, parameter. And the rest of these dogs are now lost to, the, to your breeding because you're not considering them for breeding. And then you add another genetic test or a trait or a disorder, and now you're just dealing with this portion of the gene pool, and if you add another one, and then I don't want this, so we add another one, and then all of a sudden, there's only a very small area of the gene pool that you're actually looking at for all of the dogs that fulfill your selection parameters. So there's a couple of important messages about this. One is that we only utilize a very small portion of the gene pool of what we're looking to breed to if we're using selection. And the second thing is that the, the greater number of, of traits or parameters that you're selecting for or against, the, it diminishes your what's called selection pressure or the intensity of selection for any one of those individual traits. So if you say, I'm selecting for four or against 10 things in this generation, you're not going to get a lot of progress for all 10 of them and maybe only four and maybe not for any of them because you're diluting your selective pressure. It's better to say, I'm concentrating on this mating, on correcting this and maybe this test or that test that I you know, have a carrier that I want to uh, produce some normals that I can replace my carrier with a normal in that regard. And, and when you make those selections, also consider how those things are inherited. Because a single gene trait, like some of the genetic tests you have, you can lose that gene in one generation. But complexly inherited traits or diseases can take several generations of selection to achieve your goal and to, to lose those genes or gain those genes that you want. So it's more of a longer term process in that regard. So let's talk a little bit about the registration statistics of the Great Pyrenees. I'm not going to go this far back in time, but, um, but let's just go back to 1985 
and then I'm going to go up by five year intervals till 2010. You were ranked the 53rd most populous breed by the AKC, and your popularity went up and uh, as your numbers went up, and you peaked in your numbers somewhere around 1995. And this goes for all breeds, um, where you peak about 1995, and then there was an economic downturn, and, and numbers started going down again, and, and dropped precipitously, especially for breeds that are not highly popular. So actually, this allowed you, as a breed club and breeders, to maintain better control of your breed than more populous breeds that may have lost that control to, to, to non-club members or non-fancy members um, doing your breedings. And then, uh, so by the, by the annual two years from 2010 all the way up to 2020, um, your ranking goes down because the AKC has also added a whole lot of, of additional breeds. And if those breeds have greater numbers than your breed, then they're ranked ahead of you and your number gets pushed down, even though your actual numbers may not go down that much. So we, we, we went down to about 856 in, uh, in yeah, I'm it looks like 2014, and then started going back up again. So in the last five or six years, we've seen a economic uh, turnaround, as and that absolutely follows dog breeding. Um, it's it's not a profession for most of you, and and so uh, you know, so when the economy is down, you're not doing as much breeding, and then when it's better again, we are doing more breeding, going into dog shows and so forth again. Um, I don't have the ranking for 2019 there, but you can see the numbers here. So those are your numbers. So, so over a thousand individual dogs registered each year. That certainly gives you a lot to work with for a breed. Um, you are not a low um, population breed in danger of, of you know, issues of going extinct because you have low numbers. In terms of your litter numbers, I don't have litter number for 2005, but this is how many litters. So once upon a time, you had 1,500 peer litters being born a, a year and registered with the AKC. Um, and, but now we're more in, uh, we fell down into the mid uh, 300s, and now we're up over 400 litters a year. Again, a good number to provide for us the variation that we need for selection. And for those of you that are concerned with litter size, um, these are not absolute numbers, but just using AKC registrations, individual registrations divided by litters registered, we're getting an approximation here. Um, and your breed has small litters. That surprised me for a giant breed <laughs> no. um, that you have small litters on average. And this is what's being registered. Okay, so I'm happy to hear that you have large litters. All right, but you know, but maybe you're not registering all the dogs in your litters, which I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. You know, if you think that that causes people to not be able to breed them, if you provide nothing instead of a limited registration, the limited registrations are, are um, you know, yes, people can fight them and uh, and get them, you know, pushed back, but it, it takes a lot of rigmarole to do that. I would register all of your dogs. Um, because that does provide for the owner some historical uh, context as well as being able to look up health test information to understand the health of their individual dogs as well. But for those people that are, that are worried about is litter size decreasing, you know, let's say if the, the factors that you're using down here are the same as they are up here and we can compare those numbers to, it's really not a huge change, maybe a very slight change from averaging about, about three and now we're averaging more like you know, 2.8, 2.7 up here. Um, but we also need to understand that there's a lot of environmental issues that are causing decreased litter size as well. There are a lot of environmental toxins that we deal with um, that are affecting reproduction and, and hormones and reproductive ability. So um, I don't see a lot of, you know, some, a lot of people are saying, well, litter sizes are dropping dramatically because of genetic disease and we need to outbreed everybody. And, and so we'll talk about that in this, um, a little bit later in this first half, but I don't see that occurring as an issue for your breed. Um, this is the percent of individual dogs registered that end up being bred. And so you need to kind of give yourself a four or five year lag here because some dogs aren't bred until they're a little bit older um, to be able to be counted here. But uh, pretty much for your breed, um, uh, this is looking at all of the different breeds in terms of what percentage of registered dogs actually get bred to produce the next generation. And I break it down into the 
top third most populous breeds because there's a lot more dogs out there. Um, so your numbers are different. They have a lower percentage of being bred. Your middle population breeds by population size, and then your small population breeds, uh, which which actually utilize more per, uh, a larger percent of the breeds reproduced because it's a very small population. So the average for the middle third of all AKC breeds is 11.3. You fall right here on the scale, uh, so you're actually at the higher end of the, um, of the uh, population for the middle one third um, compared to the, the breeds down here on the southern end, and your average is 9.4%. So between 2010 and 2016, over that six year period, uh, you um, bred 9.4% of the dogs that you produced. So what does this tell us about breeding? Because the population and the molecular geneticists, um, they love to look at statistics. And they love to say, um, you know, to, to utilize population statistics that were designed to study endangered breeds and natural species. And those statistics, and I was trained in population statistics, whereas they were trained in molecular genetics, and they're only kind of dabbling in the population size. All of those statistics have certain requirements, and one of the requirements is random mating without selection which does not occur in, in purebred breeds. And the second is that everyone gets the opportunity to reproduce, and that also does not happen. So what's happening here is that you're going through a genetic bottleneck every generation with your maidens, when you're only utilizing less than 10% of the dogs that you produce for breeding. And that makes your selection of who is used for breeding that much more important that they need to represent the best quality of your breed and the best health of your breed. Because you are losing over 90% of, of your gene pool with each generation, you need to make sure that who you are using to represent and reproduce your gene pool in each generation has the quality and the health to maintain your breed. So the next part of the talk follows an article that an abbreviated version is in the handout, an elongated version is on many different sites on the, on the um, internet. Um, Serious Dog has one copy, but if you just uh, Google ins and outs of pedigree, it will come up all sorts of different, different places. And, uh, and this talks about analyzing pedigrees, but specifically using uh, the Great Pyrenees breed. And I want to thank, um, I forget her name, uh, or I, I can't pronounce her name actually, but who shared the computerized uh, Great Pyrenees Pedigree Database, the large one that you have um, in the internet, and uh, to be able to use, do this analysis. So our next poll question is, my last mating was, or if you haven't done a mating, I would prefer to do inbreeding, line breeding, outbreeding, outcrossing, or crossbreeding. And I know you're saying, well, you know, what do those mean? And the next slide will define those for us, but not before you answer the poll question. What do you think you're doing with your breeds? say line breeding, 15% outbreeding, 23% outcrossing, and no one's doing crossbreeding and producing designer dogs, at least no one in this audience here. So, you know, that is a very typical response from, uh, from a breeding group. Uh, so for a geneticist, we like to use the word cross when we are actually crossing between breeds. So I know that outcrossing is, is a greater term that you use for what we would call outbreeding. So the opposites are line breeding and outbreeding. And, uh, and so really we can add 23 to 15 there and make it 38. And uh, so 38% of you do outbreeding and 54% do line breeding. Um, inbreeding is 
for a breeder definition, I understand it is more of a um, intense inbreeding, father daughter, full brother, full sister um, would be considered an inbreeding, and a less intense form would be line breeding. So let's define these. Inbreeding to a geneticist actually is breeding any dog that has a common ancestor in both the sire and the dam side of the pedigree. So any individual that appears on both the sire and the dam side of the pedigree contributes to inbreeding or what we can calculate as an inbreeding coefficient. Line breeding is a less intense form of inbreeding where you're trying to concentrate the genes of a particular ancestor. Um, and so it's breeding two individuals together that are more related than the average of the population. So now you need to understand what is the average inbreeding coefficient of the population. Am I doing a mating that's more tight than the average or am I doing a, a, a mating that's less um, intense uh, um, or less related than the average of the population? Outbreeding is breeding dogs less related than the average of the population. So breeding two dogs that are less related. And then crossbreeding is breeding two different breeds together. Okay, so, so here we have three different categories of dogs. We've got purebred dogs, uh, we've got designer bred dogs, which are crosses between two different purebreds. Um, and those took, you know, took uh, um, a big chunk of, of breeding uh, for America um, about 15 years ago. That, that was the big fad, was the designer breeds. And then we've got random bred individuals. And I used to say that random bred is, um, is, where, uh, is where the dogs themselves are making the decisions instead of the producers. So, so I would look at it as two different categories. So here you have purposely bred dogs, where a person decides which dogs are being bred together. And then uh, random bred, where the dogs do the decision themselves. Now we have something completely different going on because America now wants rescues. America wants you know rescue dogs and mixed breeds, and so and there aren't enough rescue dogs to go around to fuel America's desire for their dogs. So we have bread for rescue going on, and um, and so you have mixed breed breeding going on, and it's amazing how all these rescues come in uh, are trucked up around America, you know, and they're all eight eight to ten weeks of age. It's amazing how many rescue puppies there are out there um, but it's all due to bread for rescue um, breeding so now even random breads are being purposefully bred and the bottom line is if a human is purposefully breeding two dogs together then there's a responsibility to determine the health of the parents and whether those puppies are going to be healthy as well because if you don't look at health if you're not doing health conscious breeding there's no way that you can expect to have healthy dogs it just doesn't happen, and that's why you continually come up with issues. So unless you're selecting for health, you're not going to get health. Okay, so here's one of my favorite cartoons. You've got Fuzzy, and Rob says, ever heard the expression familiarity breeds contempt? And Satchel sits and ponders, and he says, no. In the dog world, we say familiarity breeds hip dysplasia. <laughs> so, so this is what America thinks, is that purebred dogs, because there's some inbreeding involved, are going to be unhealthy. Um, and it's what some readers think as well. But the bottom line is it's not, it's not the, the breeding of purebred dogs that creates a poor health, it's the ignoring the poor health that is going on and not selecting against it. So there are two, um, there are two uh, um, definitions that I do need to share with you so we can understand what we're talking about when we look at your gene pool. And the first one is the inbreeding coefficient. And uh, Sewell Wright, in uh, the turn of the, the 1900s, came up with, the, with this calculation. And I'm going to read the definition first, then we're going to break it down as to what it means. It's the proportion of all variable gene pairs that are likely to be homozygous due to inheritance from ancestors common to the sire dam. So what does that mean? The proportion of all variable gene pairs. So it's only the genes in your dogs, that, in your breed, that vary that we're talking about the inbreeding coefficient affecting. So the genes that make a dog a dog are non-variable, and the genes that make a Great Pyrenees a Great Pyrenees are non-variable. So you know, you've never bred two Great Pyrenees together and then all of a sudden a Chihuahua pops out. You know? and so these are non-variable gene pairs. Um, so we're only talking about the variable gene pairs in your group that are likely to be homozygous. Homo meaning the same, 
So we know that all, pair, all genes come in pairs, and one comes from the sire, one comes from the dam. So if you've got a large A and a large A that come down, then those are homozygous, because they're both the same, large A, large A. If they're little A, little A, they're homozygous. So it doesn't matter whether they're dominant or recessive or what form they are, it's just that they're the same. Um, and heterozygous means different. Hetero is different, so if you've got a large A paired with a little A, that's heterozygous. So the variable gene pairs are homozygous to inheritance from ancestors common to the sire and the dam. So the likelihood that an ancestor up here passes a large A, and that ancestor also appears on the bottom side of the dam side of the pedigree and passes down the large A, and the large A is pairing up um, in the offspring. So it's the proportion of those homozygous gene pairs. So if we say an inbreeding coefficient is 17%, we expect 17% of their non-variable gene pairs to be the same or homozygous due to inheritance from common ancestors. And it's adding up the effect of all of the ancestors that appear on both sides of the pedigree going all the way back. We can also look at the inbreeding coefficient as the probability of an individual being homozygous at only a single gene pair due to uh, receiving a gene from an ancestor common to the siren dam. What is the chance that the gene for dwarfism is going to be homozygous due to inheritance from a common ancestor on both sides? So just looking at a single gene of what that chance is. The other number I want you to understand is called the relationship coefficient. And that is a measurement of the probable genetic likeness between the individual and a particular ancestor. So if you say, I'm line breeding on George, then the relationship coefficient of 32% means that the individual whose pedigree you're looking at, uh, you would expect them to carry 30, approximately 32% of George's genes. And that's the relationship coefficient. Um, and it is, um, and there's a long formula to calculate the relationship coefficient, but the easiest way to, um, to approximate it is by using what's called a percent blood calculation. And that just provides a percentage to each position in the pedigree. So if you have an individual that's a grandparent, we know a grandparent is four of them that each pass on 25% of the genes. And if that individual is also a great grandparent on the dam side, and we know a great grandparent passes on 12 and a half percent of the genes, then the, then the percent blood of that individual is 25 plus 12.5 is 37.5 percent. Um, and, and so you just add up the numbers of times they appear in each generation to get that percent blood calculation. Okay, so here's the busy slide. This is the analysis of the entire um, uh, computerized pedigree, uh, Great Pyrenees pedigree database that I received. And it shows the number of dogs registered for each decade going back to the 2020s. And certainly there weren't just this number of dogs back in the 2020s, but these are the dogs that are in the database. And so, so we are hoping that this approximates what actually occurs in your breed, but pretty much it, you know, each database has its own uh, particulars in that regard. Um, this is the number of dogs in each of those decades, and of course we're only at the very beginning of this decade here, so there's only a small number of dogs, maybe representative of, of your breed, maybe not, um, but certainly we have enough numbers here. As I said in the 1990s, um, the registrations in America peaked out. We're looking at a worldwide database here as well. Um, the first, this column here is the number of generations, the average number of generations seen in each pedigree. So in today's modern dogs, with this pedigree database, we're looking back on an average of 43 generations of dogs. Um, the, I want you to look over here. This is the mean number of unique ancestors in the pedigree. And when I say a unique ancestor, it's an individual in the pedigree, and each individual is only counted once. So an individual in the back of the pedigree can appear thousands of times, but it's only counted once for appearing in that pedigree. So there are um, a little under 1,400 um, Pyrenees that are, uh, that are present in your modern day pedigrees right now. And you see those numbers go up over the generations. This column is calculating the inbreeding coefficient going all the way back to founders or all the way back to the individuals in the back of the pedigrees as best as those pedigrees are linked up in the database. Um, this number should not be able to go down 
over time if we're looking at the entire gene pool um, because you have a closed stud book. There are no new Great Pyrenees being produced that don't have Great Pyrenees behind them. But if a pedigree is put into the database that only goes back five generations, it, the computer thinks that that fifth generation are all founders because they don't have any parents. And, and so that's what would make this number go down over time is when new pedigrees are added that don't get, uh, aren't connected all the way back. Otherwise, this number could not go down. The 10 generation coefficient is only looking at the inbreeding coefficient based on 10 generations. So the background inbreeding in the 11th and the 12th generation fall off and are not counted. And why would you look at a 10 generation coefficient is because it tells you what's happening in that last 10 generations compared to the decade before. Are we expanding our gene pool and so that with each generation the individuals are a little less related than the average um, from the prior generation? And that indicates good breeding practice, that we don't have a strong popular sire effect, that we don't have a truncating gene pool or a limiting gene pool. And so um, we do see here that it goes up and it peaks in the 1970s and then it does go down a little bit over time here. Some people mistake my saying that to think, oh, well, if decreasing inbreeding coefficients is a good thing, then we should breed for lower inbreeding coefficients and only outbreed. And we will discuss that before we finish this first half because that is a, 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 mis, um, a misunderstanding of what I'm talking about here. And the five generation coefficient just tells you what are you doing in terms of line breeding only in the, in the most recent generations of your pedigrees? And we can see that it's lower than the 10, and, and we see that it varies. Sometimes it goes up a little, sometimes it goes down a little bit, um, depending on what you're doing for your matings. But overall, these numbers are fairly low when I compare this to all the other breeds that I look at. Now, if you're looking at averages of 11 or 10% or based on 10 generations in the 1990s and the 2000s, um, compared to other breeds, that is on the lower side. Um, and, and this is just a graphical representation of what we just saw there. And, you know, and again, this all generation number should not go down. That's because you're adding pedigrees that don't, are not complete going all the way back. Um, and then you've got your 10 and your five generations there. These are other breeds that we looked at in the 1990s and so forth. Um, and we see breeds that we expect are more inbred than the peers. You know, you've got your Norfolk Terriers and, and your Tollers. Um, you've got your breeds that are more outbred, like the Sammies and, uh, and uh, the Bouvier and the, uh, and the Short Hairs here. Um, uh, Bichons, who are popular, have a, you know, have a very high co average coefficient. There's a very large popular sire effect going on in Bichons, where a popular sire gets replaced by his son as a popular sire. And that narrows your gene pool and increases your breeding coefficients significantly over time. Um, so that is the most uh, um, limiting effect on gene pools, the, uh, that popular sire. And last thing, this is Embark's numbers, and they've done over 1,500 Great Pyrenees where they've done their um, Embark dog testing. And so they can look actually at the genes and calculate an inbreeding coefficient, which is actually more accurate than a pedigree-based inbreeding coefficient because they're not dealing with the issue of pedigrees that aren't full. They're looking at the actual genes and the actual homozygosity across the chromosomes. And your average inbreeding coefficient of, of today's dogs is about 15%. So just slightly more than what we calculated out based on the pedigrees there. And you are peaking out um, at less than what the average dog breed or average dog um, is, uh, is occurring for all pure breeds um, here. So again, um, you do not have a, a tightly inbred population that you're dealing with, which is, which is a good thing. Okay, and then this is just using the AKC pedigrees, but the AKC database does not go all the way back. Even though the AKC stud book goes all the way back, in the, um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, the AKC converted from a mainframe computer to a, you know, to, to a more you know, popular type of, of database that they now use um, for their registrations. 
And the AKC's job is not to create the most complete um, uh, pedigree database. It's, it's for registration purposes and to produce three to five generation pedigrees when requested by owners. So what they did is they just started from scratch when they started that new program. And then if they had pedigrees that go back three to five generations that people requested, they would manually add those in. But they don't have one that goes all the way back through their stud books. But these show the numbers of dogs that are registered by the AKC. And we still see the same trends that you know for all generations, we're keeping a fairly steady number here. We're not seeing a popular sire effect where it's continually going up very quickly. And, and we do see the same type of, of things going on with uh, the 10 and the five generation of call fishes. Okay, now let's look at a couple of pedigrees of dogs. Uh, no, no, not yet. Uh, so next we're gonna talk about influential Great Pyrenees ancestors. So what is the background of your breeds? And, and these are a little on the smaller side, but uh, I'll read them to you. So this is first looking at First, looking at the um, dogs that had birthdays earlier than the 1940s, and who are the most influential dogs um, across all of the dogs in the uh, database? And Sultan Dassum um, contribute 10% of the genes on average to every dog whose birthday was prior to 1940. He was born in 1919. Some of these dogs are founders, so we don't even have birthdays on them. But you see 8% to Batu de Soum, and, and I'm going to mispronounce all these French names, so excuse me for that. But you see what we do to go all the way down to the 3% here. This is the genetic makeup of dogs prior to the 1940s. In 1940, you have a couple of dogs jump in very quickly. Cop de Caril was born in 33, and he contributes 13% on average to dogs in the 40s. And uh, La Beta Dumont's Pickery uh, at 10%. Um, and we see Sultan Dassum actually fell back a little bit. I don't have a number up there for him, but, but his influence was not as overpowering as it was prior to the 40s. And some of these are carried on, and then we have some other new individuals. This one here is important because um, he, uh, Ibos Duval, uh, born in 34, he remains extremely influential even today. And uh, several others, Estato Angles at 3% um, in the 1940s is extremely influential today as well. And so here we have the 1950s, and we've got Ibis Duval jumping from 9 to 11% as the most influential individual. We have others that fell off here and others that are being maintained. And we have some new ones here that have jumped up in the 50s. And we go to the 60s, and we see Ibis Duval continuing very strong influence. These two guys that were big in the 1940s kind of fell off. And then we have a couple of new ones that are added here in the 60s. In the 1970s, uh, Larvasa de la Colina, born in 53, jumps in at 9% and continues to be extremely influential today. And so now some of you may recognize some of these dogs that you've actually may have seen back in the 70s or so, or well, they're still back in the 50s here in terms of their influence. I was Duval uh, continuing to maintain that. In the 1980s, you've got um, Larvasa de la Colina increasingly influenced and you've got a couple of others here that are jumping in um, for the first time that were born in the 60s and one bit from the 40s here. In the 1990s, um, you've got uh, two more dogs that jump in here. Uh, you've got uh, Lorvaso here maintaining significance, Estate Argolis maintaining significance, uh, to Dassum who was born you know, at the turn of the, the 1900s, still uh, strongly influential as well. In the 2000s, you had a couple of dogs that jumped in uh, very quickly at uh, 7%. I'm not even going to attempt to, to, <laughs> <laughs> to you know, read her name. Um, and then a couple of others here. And then the interesting thing would be whether they maintain their influence or whether it's just you know, someone that was popular for a little bit and then disappeared again later on, as, as we see over the years. And then just um, in the 2010s, We've got another dog that jumps in here. Um, we've got others that maintain their significance. And then for the small number of dogs different from the 2020s on, uh, we continue to see um, the influence plus a couple of dogs here that just jump on the list. 
And again, there were a very small number of dogs, so whether these actually represent all of the dogs in your breed or just the pedigrees that were put into the database from this past year, um, you know, it may be uh, a little skewed towards those, the background of those dogs. So that's the background of your breed and these ancestors here. Okay, now we're going to look at some pedigrees. And I selected some pedigrees. Um, some of your breeders uh, um, suggested pedigrees for me to look at. Um, and I selected pedigrees based on the pedigree, not necessarily the dog or their influence itself. I wanted to pick dogs that maybe you would know, um, so it would keep it interesting for you, but not necessarily you know, any, any old dog, but I wanted to demonstrate some things here. So this dog is Tip and Ship Mustang Sally. It's a bitch, actually, and uh, she was born in 2004. Does anyone know her call name? Sally. Does anyone recognize her? Yes. Sally? So, does anyone know this dog? Okay, all right. So I think Sally's pedigree. I think Sally's pedigree. And um, what we have here is, you know, we've got, you know, we've got Tip and Ship American Pride is a great grandparent on both the sire and the dam side. Um, he was bred to different bitches, so it's a half, you know, a half great grandfather um, uh, mating. Uh, we've got Tip and Ship. Uh, Polly's Magnum that also appears way back here. So, you know, strong influence as a grandparent and just a little bit of influence as a great, great, great grandparent. And then other individuals that also appear multiple times in the pedigree. So based on five generations, her reading coefficient is 13.7 because she has some close line reading going on here. On 10 generations, it's 22.2, and for all generations, it's 28.3. So, so this is a tightly bred dog. It's more than the average in the population. When we look at her analysis, um, what we find is that the most influential dog in the pedigree appeared in the third generation. It's Trotton Fox Gabriel at 29.7%, and, um, and that dog appears nine times in the pedigree. And, uh, and then we also have a couple of others, as I said here. This was the double great-grandparent um, uh, at 28.1%. And instead, we've got a couple of others here. And then we get down to Lorbasso de la Colina at 22%. Doesn't even appear to the eighth generation, but appears 1,480 times in the pedigree. So this is a dog born in 2004. And a dog born in 1953 is Lorbasso. And, uh, and he contributes almost as much as a grandparent, but doesn't appear until the eighth generation. And understand, you know, for the first time appearing in the eighth generation, a thousand times beyond the eighth generation. So first generation is a parent at 50 percent. Second generation is a grandparent at 25 percent, and it goes in half each time. So 25, 12 and a half, six and a quarter, 3.125, 1.78, uh, uh, or 0 0.78, 0.3. So 0.34 or something percent. Of, uh, by appearing in the eighth generation, but appearing over a thousand times, so it adds up to 22%. So this is how an individual becomes influential in your breed, by appearing behind so many different individuals and passing on their genes over generations. Uh, then you've got your line breeding here for an individual in the third generation, then you've got this uh, Quibbletown Impresario in the seventh generation contributing 16, much more than a, um, than a great grandparent. Uh, um, he was born in 1959. And, uh, and then we get down to Ibos here, who appears over 48,000, almost 49,000 times, doesn't appear into the 12th generation. And his stat to Arglies at 14%, was born in 1930, um, and appears over 118,000 times in the pedigree. And it's not that these are prolific dogs. I mean, the Arby's only actually had two offspring that reproduced in this database. Uh, but, but then they produced a lot more dogs, and their offspring produced a lot more dogs. And that's how that influence gets passed on over time. And then when we get all the way down to Sultan Dassum here, who doesn't appear into the 14th generation, but appears almost three um, quarters of a million times in the pedigree and contributes 10% um, to this dog's pedigree, even though he was born in, um, in 1919. Okay, and so that's the background inbreeding of your breed and the background of your breed. 
So this is a, a line-bred individual with Sally here. The next pedigree is a dog named um, R. Pure Apache Smoke of War Cry. Anyone hear of this dog? What's his call name? Okay. And, and he was born in 2016. Um, he doesn't have any offspring in the, uh, in the database. I don't know if he's reproduced or not. But as you see, there's no colored in, in information on, on, on a sixth generation pedigree. He has no line breeding within six generations. So his five generation coefficient is zero. His 10 generation coefficient is only 3.5. And his all generation coefficient is 15. So the average for your breed is, you know, based on Embark numbers is 15%. And what that is, is the background in breeding of your breed. So we talk about close line breeding, which is purposeful line breeding that you're doing, but then this, this is something you don't have any, you know, you can't do anything about. That's the background of your breed. That's all the dogs that repeat themselves and produce the, um, the, the standard and the reproducibility of your breed. So it's no surprise that looking at his, his uh, pedigree analysis, we're only looking at dogs way back in the pedigree. And the closest dog that has a, um, uh, um, that, that uh, is on both the Sarangam side of the pedigree is in the seventh generation. And that's, use cows? Yeah, okay. Um, Sundance legend, okay. So more than a great grandparent appears 34 times and So he was born in 1990, and uh, and um, and then uh, this dog here was born in 2016. But you've got now you've got um, Ivo's Duval at almost two million times in the pedigree, first appearing in the 10th generation. You've got Estate de Argelis almost five million times in the pedigree, going all the way back. Doesn't even appear until the 16th generation. And, uh, and, and then you go all the way back to Sultan Dassum at 8.5%, doesn't appear to the 18th generation, and appears almost 30 million times in that pedigree, you know, going back you know, 40 to 60 generations um, in your dog. So again, anything these guys had in their genes and in their back that passed on over generations is what you have now in your dogs. So, so this is what you're looking at in the background reading of your dogs. So the last pedigree I'm looking at is Karalaska Plumbo. Anyone hear of this dog? Okay, so he was born in 1979, so it's an older dog. And, um, and he is tightly bred. We've got um, Pimpletown Socket to him as a grandsire and a great-grandsire. So that's going to be about 37.5% uh, there. And then also as a great-grandsire, so you add another another six and a quarter to that number there. Um, you've got um, Quibbletown uh, Pika Bear as a three-time great-great-grand dam on the dam side, as well as a as a grand dam on the sire side. So you've got line reading to her, and you've got several other individuals as well. And so her reading coefficient at five generations is 27.6, at 10 generations is 34.5, and in all generations, is 36.1. So within 10 generations, most of her line breeding has already been done um, to produce that inbreeding coefficient. So it happens very quickly in her gen pedigree. It happens very slowly in um, Apache Smoke of War Christ, uh, uh, pedigree. Okay, and so here are your percentages. Again, you've got, you've got um, almost 50% um, for these two individuals um, and uh, that appear in the third and the fourth, uh, the, in the second generation appear three or four times. Here's Larvaso. So this is an older pedigree, 1979. Your percentages are still going to be about the same. Sultan at 11%, Ibos at 18.5, Estat at 15.4, but because it's a much older pedigree, they're not a as many times. So instead of appearing 30 million times, it's only 12, you know, 12,676 because it's older. 
Um, but the percentages are going to be the same because they're appearing much sooner in the pedigree. So each appearance has a much higher percentage of what's being passed on. So this is a very tightly bred dog compared to the average. So here are the three pedigrees we looked at. Uh, Tip and Chip Sally, um, we see that her reading just slowly goes down, goes up over time. So, you know, very straightforward. There are batteries for this, I think, battery strength. So if someone can check that out. Okay, whoops. I'll change the break. Okay. Um, we see um, a patch of smoke of war cry. His numbers only go up with background in reading here beyond the 10th generation. And we see uh, a Karalaska Clumbo. It goes up very quickly due to very tight line reading and then, and then just uh, remains there over time. So the depth of the pedigree that you're looking to calculate a reading coefficients on is very important. Um, to compare one dog to another. You can't compare one dog's five generation of breed coefficient to another dog's all generation or 10 generation. You've got to compare them based on the same number of generations. Okay, so next poll question. Are absolute levels of breed homozygosity and differences in homozygosity between individual dogs important? Is the average inbreeding coefficient for your breed compared to other breeds important? And is the individual inbreeding coefficient of each individual dog important, you know, for you to compare one dog to another? Yes or no? So 91% of you said yes, it is important. So the next question is, why? Why are those numbers important? diversity and issues passed on, how they influence your next litter potentially, influence of particular genes, determines predictability. Of all of those, I most agree with that last one. For consistency of type, influence the genetic health. Okay. All right, so let's talk about all of those issues here. Um, all right, can produce the type of health issues we are striving for. The expression of genetic makeup helps determine what will breed through and health influence. Okay, so let's talk about all of those aspects there because this is a very um, topical topic right now. And um, so it is something that, uh, that the commercial companies are telling you you must send in and calculate your homozygosity and you must deal with that in your breeding. Um, the expression of genetic makeup helps determine what will um, breed through. Okay. So in order to understand about breeds, you must understand about breed evolution, of understanding how your breed developed and how those numbers and those coefficients became those numbers. The development of breeds occurred through artificial selection for body type, color, coat type, behavior, and other conformational aspects. As breed lines became more specialized and studies closed, those who did not conform to the were removed from breeding. So, you know, so those that are breeding true and, and getting quality are used, and the ones that are not quality are not used and are discarded from the gene pool. 
Studies of dog breeds estimate that they lose on average a third of their genetic diversity through breed formation. And I'll tell you that actually you lose a lot more than a third of your diversity um, from where you started. So, so, and we know that we're only using less than 10% of the dogs with each generation. So we really bottleneck ourselves every generation and hopefully are selecting for what we need and not losing that from, you know, not losing the good stuff in the process of breeding with each generation. This is a typical um, Great Pyrenees pedigree from the database. And what it shows you, this is the pedigree, the part of the pedigree that you're used to looking at. Here's the individual sire, dam, grandparents, and so forth. These are the founders of your breed all the way back here. And so this, this diagram changes with each breed depending on the breed history, but they all have the same general shape, that there's a very few number of founder individuals that go all the way back. And so you have some breeding and replacing here, and some dogs are used and some dogs are discarded. And then once the breed breeds true, you start to see a population expansion um, of the breed. And so that population continues to expand and people continue to breed and breeding dogs from, from, you know, from close together, from distant uh, backgrounds together, and, and as you expand this population, and it's only because we're looking at a single dog's pedigree that it then truncates down to that individual. So this is only the dogs that contributed to this individual that are included in this pedigree. But actually, this population goes up there and goes down there for other dogs whose pedigrees we could look at um, here. So, so it actually continues all the way up and down like that. That's what your population looks like and what all dog populations look like. Some of them are much more drawn out and, and some of them are narrow for a lot longer before they go through expansion, but they all essentially have the same shape. Any selection over generations will create homozygosity, uniform purposeful selection for breeding goals. This is something we need to really understand. Selection equals homozygosity. If we are breeding Great Pyrenees, we are selecting for homozygosity. Purposeful selection for your goals, for healthy goals, for quality goals. And this homozygosity is measurable by the populate, by the molecular geneticists at Embark and Mars and these other places that are giving you homozygosity numbers, okay? It's also going to diminish the frequencies of undesirable genes. So the genes that create faults, conformational faults, are going to be discarded. And the genes that cause disease are going to be discarded and decrease in frequency with their numbers. It is a loss of genetic diversity. But it's a purposeful loss because we don't want that stuff. Okay, so don't say any loss of genetic diversity is bad because we purposefully want to get rid of stuff that we don't want. So we want to lose that diversity and create homozygosity for, for all the good stuff. That is the purpose of breeding, all right? Any selection will cause a loss of genetic diversity. It's not detrimental to the population. It's directly related to increasing its superiority. Breed-defining genes would be expected to become homozygous due to selection over time. And the molecular geneticists they can identify those, they, they can say these are what are called selective sweeps. There are pieces of chromosomes that every single Great Pyrenees are homozygous for or are at very high frequency for and only very low frequencies for other copies of those genes. And that's because everyone's been selecting for those things. So it's selective sweeping of certain genes to increase their homozygosity. These include breed-related traits for size, coat color, texture, behavior, skeletal morphology, and whatever other traits have been selected for are going to create these sweeps of homozygosity that the molecular geneticist can identify. Even without close line breeding, selective for, selection for positive traits will increase their homozygosity having originated from distant ancestors. But does it? just mean that line breeding is going to increase it. Any selection for those traits is going to cause that homozygosity to increase and those genes to become more concentrated. So modern breed population statistics provides for us high deep pedigree averaging and breed coefficients or homozygosity, low effective population size or a limited number of founders, 
Okay, high average relationships to influential ancestors, those ancestors that appear millions of times in, in the modern dogs with high percentages. Uh, these ancestors appear in every member of the breed with contributions of 15 to 35 percent, depending on the breed and the breed history. So this is what you get with every single breed. This is what molecular geneticists look at, and they compare it to endangered species and say, oh my god, there's a limited number of founders, there's high homozygosity, there's high coefficients to just individuals in the background there. This is a bad thing. We need to destroy this population structure and only outbreed and create outbred individuals because that's what a species survival plan for an endangered species that has only a limited number of individuals does, and that's what they were taught. It's the only thing that they were ever taught. They were never taught about purebred breeds and how this is breed structure that is purposefully created um, in that regard. And so this is what we need to understand because they don't, if they don't, if they do understand it, they don't want to, it doesn't sell, okay? And they need to sell you something. These are commercial companies. They can sell you homozygosity and say, we can tell you which dogs are going to be healthier because they've got lower inbreeding coefficients. And that's exactly what they're telling you. And it has nothing to do with the health of those individual dogs or of the individual breeds. So these are necessary and expected consequences of breed formation and evolution in your breeds. This is not a great Pyrenees. <laughs> um, this was my first master hunter, Mr. Smith. Um, and that's a live bird that he's carrying in his mouth there. Okay. All right, so homozygosity is not inherently correlated to impaired genetic health, nor does it need to be artificially controlled. So this is the area where I say, if we look at all the pedigrees and the generations and we see a decreasing average 10 generation coefficient, that means you are utilizing the breadth of your pedigree background in creating your dogs. And that with each generation, because the generation is expanding, the relationship between the parents on average goes down over time. And that is a healthy gene pool. But it's not the number that is the goal that you're selecting for, because that's what the molecular geneticists say is, if that's what we're selecting for, only breed matings with low numbers, and you'll get those low numbers quicker. But that will destroy the, the population structure of your dogs. Healthy breed gene pools require expanding or large stable populations. It allows the creation of new family lines, allows for within breed diversity, and population contraction causes the loss of breed diversity and quality breed lines. So hopefully with the economic um, uh, decreases in breeding that occurred in the 90s and, and uh, 80s and 90s and then um, coming to now where we're expanding again, hopefully we didn't lose entire lines um, and entire chunks of our gene pool. Hopefully it's just that the breeding slowed down and then it sped up again. But it is important to recognize quality lines and breeders that are retiring and if their lines are still continuing to be maintained in the gene pool because that's a very important aspect of maintaining breed pool, uh, gene pool diversity. Selection of breeding animals should represent quality traits and the breadth of pedigree background and quality lines should not be abandoned. So it's a very important aspect because that's what genetic diversity is. It's the diverse background of the individuals in the gene pool. It's not the matings that they are, that they are um, uh, being uh, bred with because that's what affects the inbreeding coefficients of matings. If you take the same dogs and you line breed all of them, your average inbreeding coefficient is going to be high. If you take those exact same dogs and you outbreed them to the least related, the inbreeding coefficients are going to be low. Have you changed the genetic diversity of your population? Have you changed the genes in your population? No, it's the exact same dogs that you're using for breeding. So it's got, so the inbreeding coefficient has nothing to do with genetic diversity. Um, genetic diversity has to do with who you're selecting for breeding and do they represent the breadth of your gene pool. The popular sire syndrome is the number one cause of limited genetic diversity in breeds. So this is a, um, a geneticist pedigree, squares are males, circles are females, horizontal lines are matings, and vertical lines are offspring. And so here, you know, as a representation, we'll call this a diverse gene pool. It would have to be much bigger to represent the entire gene pool. And let's say a dog comes along, and everybody oohs and ahs and says, oh my god, this dog's fantastic, and I want to breed to him. So they start breeding to him, and they like what they see. He's producing well, so more um, that just from across the gene pool 
spoonful of bread to him, and then people start line reading on him, and they like what they see, and very quickly his genes become dispersed across the entire gene pool within, within a couple of years, you know, not even just generations. So that's the popular sire syndrome. It is the single most influential factor in restricting breed gene pool diversity. The overuse of a popular sire quickly disseminates his genes throughout the gene pool without the benefit of evaluation over time. And that's a very important aspect, without the benefit of evaluation over time of what genes he actually is carrying and what he is passing on. And if what we find is that what, what he's passing on is detrimental, we need to select against him. You know, if all of the quality bitches or a large portion of them are going to a single male line, um, and then you need to purge him, you're actually purging all of the quality bitch lines from that generation that were brought to him as well and losing their influence. And then the insidious part of the popular sire syndrome is that it causes the loss of other quality male lines that should be contributing to the gene pool. So if, if a popular sire is getting you know, the best quality bitches from your breed, then you are sidelining other male lines that should be contributing to your gene pool and maintaining that diversity. And that's the importance of the popular sire syndrome. And some people would say, well, what's the difference between a popular sire and an influential ancestor? An influential ancestor has 15 to 35 percent of the relationship to everyone in your, in your breed. An influential ancestor's contribution is continually evaluated through its descendants who have to compete with others for breeding status. So if an individual produces quality, they'll be used and their offspring will be used. If they stop producing quality or they're producing undesirable things, their influence goes down very quickly, they're not being used. So an influential ancestor, every generation has to be evaluated through their descendants to see if they're gonna be used for breeding or not. Whereas a popular sire is just bred without that evaluation until, um, until those genes are spread. And I said here, it can cause the loss of the quality dam lines um, that he was bred, so we have to select against him. So lastly, for this first half here, I want to talk about diseases and disorders, or what I call the dark side of breed development. So all individuals carry some deleterious mutations. Everyone's got some mutations. Quality individuals who propagate will also propagate their deleterious mutations, and these can cause breed-related disease if they're disseminated and increase in frequency through the founder's effect. So this is how bad genes become diseases in a breed. Um, breed propagation must always include active monitoring and selection against genetic disease. Monitoring is genetic screening, and we'll talk about that in the second half, and and breed health surveys, active breed health surveys that tell you exactly what's going on in your breed, and selection, you know, just doing the screening but then not using those results in, in deciding who gets bred. If you don't use monitoring and selection, it doesn't work, okay? Without this selection, the genetic health of the breed will decline. So if you are not doing health conscious breeding, the health of your dogs is gonna decline. Health is not a natural thing, in artificially selected populations. We don't have, um, you know, we don't have natural selection, you know, where dogs are dying and they don't get to reproduce because they're sick or whatever. We'll reproduce all sorts of sick stuff. And so we really need to pay attention to what those dogs are carrying, and especially for breed-related issues. The genetic health of a dog breeds is not a direct function of homozygosity or heterozygosity, but the accumulation of specific disease liability genes. And this is, this is the basic argument and debate that goes on. Is homozygosity, you know, is it homozygosity that causes disease? Because homozygosity pairs up genes. And so if there are recessive genes or additive genes that are liability genes for disease, increasing their homozygosity will increase their expression going from a carrier state where you don't see them to an affected state where you do see them. So if, if you carry those genes and you increase homozygosity, you'll see disease. And that's the whole basis of, of, their, of the molecular genesis saying, you know, you must breed the matings with the lowest possible homozygosity and you're not pairing up your deleterious genes. Um, but it's not homozygosity that causes disease. 
It's the deleterious genes themselves. And so that's what we need to select against. We need to select against disease-causing genes and select poor quality genes. If you're selecting just against homozygosity, you're selecting against the homozygosity of all the good genes as well as the bad genes. You're, there is no differentiation there as to which ones you're selecting against. So, so you will backtrack on, on the good stuff as well as on the bad stuff there. Um, if there are low frequency genes in your gene pool and the molecular genesis say you need heterozygosity, you're going to increase the frequency of those low frequency genes, even though the reason they're low frequency could be for, for due to generations of selection against, um, against faults and against diseases. Your, the molecular geneticists are saying you need to increase the frequency of those genes to maintain heterozygosity in your breed, and it's absolutely the wrong thing to do in that regard. So we need to pay attention to specific liability genes when we're trying to create health and quality in our breeds. So breed maintenance, um, so I've been talking all along here about these species survival plan outbreeding programs that are being presented to you. You must always outbreed. Um, only breed to those least related in the population. And the Kennel Club in the UK has something called Mate Select. And you put your dog in and it will select for you the dog that is the least related to your dog and say that is the best possible mating for your dog. Okay, so do we all want to do that? No. <laughs> Why not? It's the least possible related. It's the most outbred. Okay, but that's the whole purpose of, of what is being suggested to us by the molecular geneticists. But what happens is that if we're only outbreeding, it homogenizes the breeds and erases the genetic difference between individuals. So we need lines of dogs that are different from each other so that we can select, that we can say, my dog lacks this, but this line has it, and I want to bring it in. So I will outbreed to that line to bring something in this novel that I don't have. And that's the purpose of outbreeding, is to bring something in that you don't have. And then line breeding to try to fix or, or, or solidify those traits that you're trying to bring in. So, so line breeding and outbreeding are tools, but they are not the goals of breeding. If with this process here, if you take two dogs, you say I need the least related and I breed them together, they're now their offspring, those lines are now related. So to outbreed in the next generation, you have to find a third line that's unrelated to those first two, and you breed them, and then in that next generation, they're all related. And so now you've got to find someone that unrelated those three lines and breed to them in the next generation, and you'll quickly run out of dogs that are unrelated. So now everyone's related, everyone's you know, similar in the center of the gene pool, you don't have differences between dogs, so you don't have that selection pressure or differential to be able to select for something different because everyone's the same and it's all just a mishmash. And, and that's what this whole process would, would produce in a purebred breed. And we've got this Wisdom Health Optimal Selection gives you these, Embark gives you heterozygosity, Dr. Peterson's Federogenetics Lab at UC Davis gives you all of these, and they're telling you, you must outbreed, you must outbreed, and that's what, you know, what the, the overwhelming pressure is on us right now in this regard. None of the types of matings change the frequency of defective genes or their dissemination. As I said, it's all the same dogs being bred um, in that regard. It will not change the frequency of deleterious genes. For dispersed breed-related deleterious genes, outbreeding will not reduce the frequency of affected individuals. You'll still get the same number of dogs with osteosarcoma, the same number of dogs with, you know, with the different diseases that you see in your breed, but they'll just occur in a random fashion. And if you want to know what that looks like, look at the pure, look at the um, cat population in America, because 95% of all cats are random bred cats. But as veterinarians, we see genetic disease every day in cats. We see inflammatory bladder disease, we see diabetes mellitus, we see allergies, you know, but we're just seeing them randomly. So it doesn't change their frequency, it just, it just, it's more a surprise when they show up because we've now broken you know, all of those family lines apart. So, um, so those are the tools of breeding and not the goals of breeding. Um, and it has nothing about, about increasing the genetic diversity of the breed. It has to do with selection of individuals from the background. Um, so all breeds are inbred with many different parameters causing changes in homozygosity genetic diversity. None of the manipulations have to do with the health of the breed or selecting for against specific health 
or disease or liability genes. Selection for heterozygosity selects for the good, um, selects against good homozygosity as well as bad homozygosity. It blindly increases minor frequency alleles, as I said, and they're likely minor due to selection over generations against deleterious traits and diseases. So my mantra is that genetic diversity is breeder diversity. It's everyone doing something a little different that allows the diversity of our population. If some people want to line breed on this line and some on that, if some people need to bring something in and want to outbreed to this one, everyone doing something different is what provides a, um, a nice, healthy gene pool. You can't legislate it, you can't make rules for it, um, but it's just everyone doing something a little differently. Um, it's the varied opinion of breeders as to what constitutes the ideal animal and their selection of breeding stock that maintains the breed diversity. When breeders have issues with genetic disease, the only way to improve their gene pool is through screening and selection against diseases and their associated liability genes. There is no quick fix. Lower your breeding coefficient, they'll be healthy. It doesn't work, okay? There's no quick fix. You want healthy dogs, you need to select against the specific diseases that are occurring in your breed. Moderation away from extremes that cause disease should be a guiding principle in breeding and judging. Luckily, you don't have a lot of extremes that you're dealing with in your breed. You know, you're not breeding for bigger and bigger peers. You know, you're not saying, you know, we need bigger, bigger dogs. Oh, we're above the standard. We need to change our standard, make them make the standard bigger now. You know, that's not occurring in your breed. So that's a good thing that you're not dealing with the extremes that some um, breeds are dealing with. Pre-breeding health screening should become as universal as an equine pre-purchase exam. This is one of my new mantras here. If you're a horse person, no one would buy a horse without having a vet check it out. Because if the horse has laminitis or navicular disease or you know, anything that's going to prevent you from being able to utilize that horse, you know, then you've spent your money and, and you've got a worthless, you know, you've got a lovely horse for your backyard, but you can't do anything with it. Okay? So this this Pre-breeding health screening should become as universal as a as a pre-breeding health uh, exam on a horse. It's that it's automatic. If I'm thinking of breeding this dog, I'm doing my health screenings. I know exactly what I'm getting out of this dog, exactly what I can breed based on what we can test for. So the last slide here in this first half: breed maintenance requires avoiding popular sire syndrome, utilizing quality dogs from the breadth of your population to expand the gene pool monitoring genetic health issues through regular health surveys, doing genetic screening for breed-related disorders, participating in open health registries to manage genetic disease, and consist on constant selection for quality and for health. And that's what's going to maintain your breed as a quality breed and as a healthy breed. Okay, it, it is just before the halfway point. It's 9.56, so I'm gonna give you 10 minutes now until um, until 10.06 when we will resume and do the rest of the, uh, the seminar. Thank you.